Amen. Well, grab your Bibles and turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians or 1 Californians, chapter 5. And um, we are going to be looking at uh, a message that we started last week. And I got to tell you, I don't know how long we're going to be going through this portion of Scripture because it is so vitally important. And I know that we're coming up on the Christmas uh, messages, and we're going to have to probably break from uh, this portion of Scripture after today, and then we'll come back and revisit because we can't get it all in. This is now an unplanned series <laughs> by virtue of the fact of how important it is in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 8, and we're looking at a message in this series entitled, Saints, Sex, and Sinners. And Paul is speaking to the church at Corinth, and he's writing to them because they had erred so terribly in their witness as what a church should look like. Listen, you're going to hear this over and over again today in this message. Church family, listen. The church is not supposed to be like the world. The church is supposed to be completely different than the world. The church is to stand out. And when the church is different, and when the church stands out, it will by nature, that is supernatural nature... Because the Holy Spirit's at the helm, the Word of God is being taught, people are growing in the grace and knowledge of Christ, and they are leaving their old life. When that happens, the church will become a living, breathing organism giving glory and honor to God, while at the exact same moment, it, be, it becomes uh, an enemy uh, to those who don't want anything to do with it. When I say an enemy... Uh, the world will criticize, attack, and mock, and try to undermine it. In one of the most profound ways we know in Scripture of Satan destroying a local church or a regional church or a body of gatherers around the Lord Jesus Christ is by compromise. It's been said that compromise is the most dangerous word in the English language because if you can get someone to compromise on their morality or on their values or on the scriptures, then it is a slippery slope that leads downward to decay. And the church at Corinth had experienced a terribly profound decay as they departed from the clear teachings of scripture to be what they thought a relevant, cool, happening church in the city of Corinth. And that is a tremendous price to pay. And they're paying it. So follow along with me as we jump into part two of our message today. 1 Corinthians 5 verse 1. Paul says to them, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you. And such sexual immorality is not even named among the Gentiles. That is, a man has his father's wife. A young man is cohabitating with his stepmother. And you are puffed up, arrogant, proud. The word, remember, in the Greek means to have a head full of air. <laughs> You're, you have an airhead of arrogance. And you've not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I indeed, as absent in body but present in spirit, have already judged as though I were present him who has done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together, along with my spirit and with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glory is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, or without leaven, or without yeast. Since you are truly unleavened, for indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast not with old leaven, or with the sinful old life that you and I used to have, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Quickly, by way of review, we know this. Remember this. And, and boy, I tell you, if you're here today for the, for the first time, you're at a handicap because you don't have last week to build upon. And so you can go online, or you can go to the media room, and you can get the teaching about what we're building upon now before you come to some judgment. But we remember this, that when Paul wrote to the church at Corinth in chapter 1, verse 1, he says, to the church of God which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified. The word is past tense. That is that by their faith in Christ, they had already been declared by God to be sanctified. That is a vessel set apart to the glory of God. You've got to remember that, where we're going right now. Sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. 
God had declared them to be holy people of God. That's the context. You say, Jack, I, I, I thought you just read that they were involved in sexual immorality. Yes, we're going to talk about that again today. But the truth of the matter is, God had called this man that is sinning and the church, and because of their faith in Christ, it is recorded in heaven that these were saints. And I know that you and I have this mind block about what a saint is because we've been brought up to think that a, that a saint is something that is declared or decreed by man. It is not. As we get into this, you remember that last week we looked at our first point regarding saints, sex, and sinners, and that is that we are to be recognizing the dangers of sexual sin. And there's three things that we pointed out. That sexual sins carry a greater weight than any other type of sin. Number two, that sexual sins pack a greater burden. That is that they affect our human lives in such a profound way because we learned that sexual sin is a sin that has spiritual connections to it. Unlike (laughs) robbing a bank, though I'm not encouraging that, or telling a lie, though I'm not encouraging that. God says in the Bible that sexual sin carries a greater, greater burden. And then we saw that sexual sin steal a greater peace. That is a peace like the peace of your heart, not peace like a calm river. A peace of your heart, a peace of your life is taken when it comes to sexual sins outside of marriage. And we looked at the fact that God has established marriage. Jesus said in Matthew 19 that regarding marriage, that a man and a woman are to leave their homes and come together as one flesh. And you guys now know what one flesh means, body, soul, and spirit. It's not just sex. It is body, soul, and spirit. The emotional set, the mind, the soul, soulology. We get the word psychology from suke, which is the soul, the mind, the thinking. When a couple comes together, they have been talking, dialoguing, and they've been bonding emotionally. And that happens in a relationship. That's why you don't want to rush into something. And then secondly, there is that spiritual aspect where they grow spiritually together. That's why the Bible says, for a Christian. Listen, for a Christian. I was asked so many questions last week that I was teaching clearly, but people don't listen so well, and they come up and they say, well, you know what, were you meaning that a Christian should marry a Christian? Hmm. What does the Bible say about that? Marriage is tough enough. God says, if you're a Christian, you are to marry a Christian spiritually bonding together. And then the, the frosting on top of that cake, which physically symbolizes the emotional unity and the spiritual unity, is what happens on your honeymoon night. <laughs> and to do anything outside of that, the Bible says, in the life of a believer or a non-believer, it's sexual immorality. Remember what the word meant? It's the word pornea in Greek, and it means this, any unauthorized, Sexual behavior, any sexual activity outside of marriage, which is fornication, adultery, incest, unlawful lust, is what's called pornea. We get the word pornography or porn from this Greek word. So now we look at this in our study. Mark it. Here we go. It's point number two in our study. It's this. Saints, sex, and sinners is found in verses two and three, and that is that we are to be repenting before a loving God. What if, as this man is, this young man who has fallen into this sin, what is to be done? And how does it affect the church? And how how about our day, 2,000 years later? We are to, number one, be repenting before a loving God. And you need to write that down. Because maybe you're here this morning and, and you're not a Christian or you are a Christian and you have ventured into sexual sin. God wants you to repent before him now because he loves you. Know that. See, I don't want to hear that. Listen, don't run out or don't walk out on the very one who loves you the most. Because just because of the fact that you and I have crossed a line or we've told a lie or we went too fast on the freeway or whatever it is, do you understand that God, in Christ Jesus, the Bible says, reconciled the world to himself by Christ going to the cross. And there is no sin that he will not forgive. If, but there's, there's a qualifier, if we, what? Yes, repent of it. You see, Jack, I can't believe in the 21st century you're using that word. Repent is a, is a Greek sailing term to turn your boat around. That's what it means, to turn 180 degrees, your boat. 
So if in your mind right now this morning, let's say you're not a Christian and you're saying, man, wow, I'm guilty of sexual sin. God says to you, I want you to come and repent before me. If you are a Christian today and you have erred in this activity, you've sinned, God is convicting you and he's saying, listen, you need to repent before me. One restores fellowship with God and one brings a person into a saved relationship. It's a big deal, church. So listen, we'll go as far as we can this morning. Mark it down. Number one, repenting before a loving God means that as a church, we repent of our actions. Paul is not only speaking to a man, he is speaking to the church at Corinth. Look at verse two. And you are puffed up and have not rather mourned. You need to circle that. All of us need to do that as Christians because number one, what is implied here is actually very, very sad. And you are going to think, I'm making this up, and I want you to research this for yourself. What's sad about this is there is a false doctrine that is implied that the church at Corinth is arrogant and puffed up about this man living in sin. They were boasting about it, and they were using it as a display of how, listen, of how tolerant they were. Today, our culture has taken the word tolerant and has deified the word. If you are labeled as somebody that's intolerant, you are a bigot, you are a weirdo, you are crazy. Yet, Noah Webster, who authored the 1828 Dictionary of the English Language for the American Colonies said that tolerance or to tolerate something is to agreeably disagree with someone who holds a different view. Today in our world, if you hold a view that is not acceptable by Wall Street or by Main Street or by the media definition of what tolerance is, if you hold a different view, you are now labeled instantly what? Intolerant. Our modern culture doesn't even know the meaning of the word. Let me, let me put it to you like this. If there was a cobra snake in your house and you had little kids, forget about little kids, I don't do snakes. If it was my apartment and I had a snake in that house, that, that was some, somebody says, you got a snake in your house, I'm not going in the house. I, I, although I would go in the house with a shotgun and I will kill that snake. You say, Pastor, I like snakes. That's your problem. I read the Bible, you don't talk to snakes and you don't have snakes. Here's the thing. I'm going to blow that thing up with my shotgun. Why? I am very intolerant to snakes. Okay, very intolerant. There is an intolerance that's good. And Paul is saying, and he's going to be teaching, he's just started it by saying, you guys have been puffed up about this sin that's in your church, and you've been talking about, listen, how gracious your church is. And they have violated the very word of grace. Oh, we're tolerant. They violated the very word tolerant. They were filled, Paul says, with hot air in their heads. They had become arrogant. The very sin that they should have dealt with, they wound up featuring it as how great of a church they were. And Paul says, it is wrong. You should have rather mourned. He's talking about the leadership mourning. And this is a great introduction to us regarding this word or this statement of cheap grace. Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote a book that every Christian should read. It's called The Cost of Discipleship by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And in the first chapter of that book, Bonhoeffer says, Never call cheap that which cost God everything in the life of his son. God's grace is for when we fall down. God's grace is for when we trip up. God's grace is what keeps us going. It is not something whereby you and I say, well, you know what? I'm going to go to church on Sunday, and then I'm going to live like Hades all the rest of the week, and God's grace will cover me. In theology, that is called antinomianism. And the Bible says God will not forgive those kinds of sins. In the Old Testament, they called them sins of the high hand. It means that I'm going to sin, and God will forgive me. Listen. If any teaching in this pulpit or in any setting in the world says you can follow God and you can sin and then quickly get your sin dissolved from you and you can just keep living like that is false doctrine says the Bible you cannot do that you are flirting with disaster it doesn't mean you're not a believer it means you're flirting with disaster 
We need to repent of our actions as a church and as a people. In Romans chapter 6, verse 14, the Bible says, For sin shall not, write that down, sin shall not have dominion over you. The word is control, rule, authority. Did you, did you know that? Sin. Boy, our young people today need to hear this. Sin shall not have dominion. I got young people saying, my parents need to hear that, Jack. Sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but grace? God forbid. You see, it's the grace that keeps you and I walking on the straight and narrow. Jesus says, narrow is the way that leads to eternal life. And few there be that find it. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many be on that path. The churches, in this case the church at Corinth, its tolerance of sin was as bad as this man's individual sin of sexual immorality. They had entered into it. Listen, this might freak you out. But if you know a brother or a sister in Christ who is living in sexual immorality... Don't you go tell the world that that brother or sister is living in sexual immorality. You're a gossip and you're sinning. What are you supposed to do? You are supposed to go to that brother and that sister in a very peaceful setting and with a broken heart, and I believe you shouldn't attempt it without fasting and prayer. You go to them with a broken heart because you love them and you tell them, listen, I'm going to say something and I'm going to love you anyway, no matter what you do with this. But I know that you guys are wrestling, and you ought not to be wrestling around. <laughs> you know what I mean by wrestling. <laughs> Granted, listen, if it's a true brother or sister, they're going to say, man, you're right. If they're not, they're going to say, you know what? You're judging me. That's what I most often hear. You're judging me. No, I would never do that. And I don't have the authority to do that. But God's word judges our lives together. And if you love somebody, you'll tell them. You remember how good, I don't know if I said it in this service last week, but I said if you really love somebody, you'll tell them. You know, like I I did a wedding. Every wedding I do, one of the last things I say before we come down the aisle, and if if I've done your wedding, you know that I say this to the guys. We're getting ready to march down the aisle. So, okay, you guys ready? We're ready. You guys in order? We in the right order? Okay, right. Okay, listen. Make sure your zippers are up. Because they're putting on suits, they're tucking in shirts, the zippers are always down. Before the wedding, out in the hall, check your zippers. Why do I say that? Because I love these guys. Okay? Last week I said, you know, if you love somebody, if they have a booger on their lip, you're going to tell them, you know. (laughs) And I'm not going to say exactly who it was leading worship last Wednesday night, but God is so good. That there was a thing right there. It was a piece, he had some rice on his lip and he was going to go sing. And I said, you need to, and he goes, what, what? I go right there and he goes, what is it, what is it, what is it? (laughs) And he turned all red and I said, listen, I told you because I love you. I didn't want you to go out and sing in front of the people with a piece of rice on your lip. They would have thought it was a booger. And you wouldn't have worshipped, you would have been looking at that thing on his lip. When you see that brother or sister who's not walking with Jesus and they should be, it's like that. It's like, oh man, I love them, but I don't want to tell them. I hurt their feelings. Hurt their feelings? You want to rescue them. How much do you love them? J. Vernon McGee, don't you love him? I get to listen to him on the way to church on Sunday mornings. He says a pure church is a powerful church, but a powerless church is a dangerous church. And sin takes the power out of a church. Paul says you should have been mourning. The word means to be moved to grief, to fall sick, or to be overcome with sadness and sorrow. You should be sad, Paul is saying, sorrowful for what this means to the cause of Christ, to the church at Corinth, and to the population of those watching Corinth. He is saying that the church leaders should have a state of, and be in a state of grief when someone's not walking with Jesus. Think about that. True shepherds, true pastors. When someone is not walking with the Lord, it should grieve them. Galatians 6 verse 1 says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in a trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness, considering yourselves lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And if you read the scriptures, what is the law of Christ? 
It is the law of love. But listen, I don't want to stress that part over the fact that Paul is saying that he's rebuking the church at Corinth and its leadership because they didn't handle it. Why don't churches today deal with sin in the church? Why do not church leaders deal with sin within, the, within their church? We'll talk about this today and in our next study together on this, but this is a critical thing. Are people called to the pulpit in the pulpit? Are people occupying the place of, of a teaching or leadership ministry in a church? Why are they there? A church should not tolerate sin in the camp. The book of Judges warns us about this. The book of Joshua warns us about this. But it's got to be done in such a way that you can't come down on people in some arrogant fashion. You need to consider yourself lest you also be tempted. But at the same time, a healthy church is a church that is alive. And the reason why it's alive is because, listen, that organism, the body of Christ is moving, breathing. And listen, at times it takes a bath. But we are to never, we are to love, yes, but never allow, condone, tolerate a brother or sister that is continuing on in sexual immorality. The Bible says that's pornea. And why didn't, you know, listen, why wasn't the church at Corinth mourning over this? They were puffed up because the leadership was puffed up. Because the leadership didn't deal with it. Listen, this is scary. But you know from our Wednesday night teachings that Paul had said in another place that I want you to imitate me as I imitate Christ, right? And a church will, co- will become like its leadership. And let me tell you why it's terrifying. God has engineered that so. God has engineered that. Every church, have you noticed when you go to churches, every church has its own personality, has its own flavor, its own feel, its own priorities? That's of God. God put personalities. That's why it's so cool. Look, on a Sunday morning right now, right here in southern Babylon, (laughs) churches are packed. Churches are full. All over the place. Why? It's just like Friday night in town. Not everybody eats at P of Chang's. Not everybody eats at California Pizza Kitchen. All those places are packed because people have different appetites with different flavors being served. God knows that. In a church, and it works like that. But when the church leadership is bad, then what happens is that it diffuses that down into the life of the body. If the church leadership's holy, the body's going to be holy. Big difference. And so you need to keep that in mind. In Romans chapter 16, verse 17, the Bible says, I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions. I, every church has got troublemakers. And offenses, contrary to doctrine which you learned. And avoid them. Wow, can you believe the Bible says this? People causing rifts everywhere they go, the Bible says avoid them. You're probably thinking, well, that's not very tolerant. The context is a little leaven leavens the whole lump. A little bit of yeast causes your cake to explode into a gigantic freaky bun. It's not normal. Take out the leaven and uh, you'll have a cake. And the Bible is saying, listen, people who do not want anything to truly do with God and growing onward with the Lord, the Bible says avoid them. You know any gossip, people who gossip, avoid them. You know people who, who wherever they go, they leave division. Wherever they go, they, they divide. They don't multiply, they divide people. Avoid them. Yeah, but you know what? Avoid them. But this person, she's not, avoid them. I'm telling you, man, avoid them. Romans 16, 17, still in the Bible, it's powerful. Look at, continuing in verse 2, repenting before loving God means that as a church we repent of our lethargy. The church at Corinth was lethargic. He says that he who has done this deed might be taken away from you. The word take away means to exit, to leave, to go away, to be removed from the gathering. Now we need to be careful about this because this is where, this verse is where excommunication came from. The word in Greek is exactly that. But here's the thing. Excommunication, you need to understand something. Oh boy, listen. No one has the power 
thank God, no one has the power who, when they disagree with you, even if it's some church and its leadership, if you're a Christian, no organization's got the authority to say, we excommunicate you. Amen. You're, uh, you're, you'll never make it to heaven. No one's got that authority. Nobody. Pope doesn't have it. Billy Graham doesn't have it. Uh, whoever you're thinking about in your head, they ain't got it. No man on, on the planet. When Paul says, take this guy that's sinning and cast him away from you, he's saying sever his fellowship and he's not allowed at the church. He's, there's a great reason why, and I hope we get to it today. If I would just hurry up, we would. You're going to see by the end, it's all done in love, and it's all to get the guy to come back around to Christ. By the way, remember this. I said it last week. I'll say it this week and the next time. The woman's not mentioned at all in this. It takes two to wrestle. She's not mentioned because she's not a Christian. The man who's in trouble is a man who's a Christian. Why? The Bible tells us that God spanks his kids. Well, pastor, I would never spank my child. Oh, remind me to never want to meet your kids. The Bible says a child left to himself brings reproach to his mom. That's like that kid I saw at Toys R Us slapping his mom's face because she wouldn't buy him the toy. Boom! No, you can't have that. Boom! Man, I wanted to walk right up to her and just go, boom! <laughs> Not the kid. The kid was trained this way. Don't, don't repeat that. Don't repeat that I said that. But... And then, of course, you know what happened? The kid got the toy after all. So what does that enforce? The kid thinks, wow, slapping mama produces a toy. It's like walking up to a gumball machine. Putting in a quarter produces a gumball. Slapping mama gets toys. That's how a kid thinks. That's how people think. The lethargy that the church was exhibiting at Corinth was dangerous. And Paul is saying, hey, take this guy, walk him out, pray for him put him on the street. He wants to live like the world? This is how God talks to his church. He wants to live like the world? Then go play in the world. Didn't the prodigal son go play in the world? This is the exact same story. Think about that. The prodigal son went and played in the world, got sick of it, huh? He got fed up with it. Came back home to Papa. We know later from Scripture that this man will come back. We find out in 2 Corinthians that this guy repents and comes back. Isn't that cool? It's nice being here now. You know the end of the story. But what about you today? Where are you living? You say, well, nobody knows, Jack, that I'm sleeping with bubbles. Nobody knows. Hey, let me, let me tell you something. God knows, and the book of Numbers says, your sin will find you out. God, you may think you're fooling people walking around, and there's a big sign over your head, and God is giving his people discernment because he loves you. He won't let you live like that. He's reaching you. So, in 1 Corinthians 5, look at, sneak ahead to verse 11. We're not there. Don't even get your hopes up. But look, look a few verses down at verse 11. It says, But now I am writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who calls himself, what? A brother who is sexually immoral. Regarding such a man, you're not even to eat with him. Now, read that. Look at that carefully. Are you supposed to eat with non-believers? Yeah, witness to them, love them. Isn't that interesting? But someone who knows the way and is not walking in the way, a fellow brother or sister in Christ, the Bible says don't eat with them. That's not mean. It's to get them to understand that just as God, are you guys with me? Just as God is not talking to them, did you know that? First uh, John 1, verses 7 through 9 says so. And Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 says so. God says, my hand's not too short that I can't save you. And my ear is not deaf that I cannot hear you. But your sins have separated you from me so that I will not listen to you and I will not save you. When we sin as Christians, we break fellowship with God. We're still his kids. He, God does not believe in abortion. If you're in the family, you're in the family. But if you're not walking with him, you're going to suffer. And in this case, sexual immorality is a tremendously profound sin because it affects our very soul. 
Listen to this. Is this not sweet? James 5, verses 19 to 20. This is an amazing verse. James 5, 19 to 20 says, My brothers, if any one of you should wander from the truth, he's talking to brothers now, and someone should bring him back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save him from death and cover over a multitude of sins. Notice it says save him from what? Death. Not save him from hell. Jesus saves people from hell. If you know a brother or sister who's caught up in sexual immorality or sin for that matter, and you reach them and bring them back into the fold, you have delivered that brother or sister from a life of grief that could even lead to death, premature death. Amazing, huh? Also this, repenting before a loving God means that as a church we repent of our doctrine. We repent of our doctrine. I'm not talking God's doctrine. I'm talking our doctrine. Look at verse 3. It says, For indeed, as absent in body, but present in spirit, I have already judged as though I were present, says Paul, him who has done this deed. Doctrine. Somehow the church at Corinth thought, it's okay to live like this. You know, things like this. Oh, we believe in the Bible, but you know, some of it's really old. Oh, we believe in parts of the Bible. You know, there's a group out there. Did you know this is a group out there called the Red Letter Group? We only believe in the red letter parts. Only the words that Jesus has spoken. And it's interesting because they hold a certain uh, view in life. A certain, they, uh, they, they've selected a, a, an alternate lifestyle. And their claim is the red letters don't address that lifestyle. And yet it does. The red letters do. But that is to say, number one, my authority, my doctrine is over God's because what they're saying is God's book from Genesis to Revelation, is not his book. There's not far from here. What are those guys called? The, uh, is it the Jesus Seminar people? Up there at the Claremont School of Theology, and they'll tell you, they will tell you, they have decided which verses in the entire Bible are of God and not of God. Is that amazing? We will tell you what's of God. Wow. Somewhere I read in the Bible, it says, if you add to or, dis- or take away from this book the plagues of this book will be given to you don't mess with god's bible verse by verse line upon line i'd like you to write this down if you would if you care about this i I hope you do that uh, i'm going to talk about what a real biblical christian church is kind of started with it with the introduction a real biblical christian church i have to insert biblical christian church is to be so radically different from the world that, one, it causes eyes to burn, as it were. Man, there's too much light coming out of that person or that place. I'm talking about spiritual light, obviously. That's the church that causes problems. Really, what kind of problems are we talking about? Everybody was fine with not praying in Jesus' name until that church over there in Chino Hills got wind of it. And the city fathers were fine with it until that church petitioned the city fathers and then printed up a bunch of t-shirts that said, I pray in Jesus' name. And it made everybody uncomfortable. Makes your eyes burn. It's too much light. Wait, someone turn down the light. A radical church for Jesus, number two, makes lives uncomfortable. We don't say this in a sarcastic way. But we know this, that when the word of God is Todd, it's going to make some people come to Christ and some people reject Christ. We know it's going to make some people break down. It's going to make some people be very encouraged. That's not our job. We're to present the word of God and God, the Holy Spirit, does with the word as he sees fit. But a church that is alive and real and it's a biblically based church is going to, by nature, make people uncomfortable. Last week, I got emails about how uncomfortable it made some people in the church that I... They were uncomfortable with the title of the message. And I got one guy who just railed on me, and then the next email I got was a woman who said, my 12-year-old has never taken notes before on a Sunday morning. (laughs) That's cool. The Word of God slices and dices. It opens up and it heals. You can shoot the messenger, just make sure... You're a good aim. Don't wound me. 
But that's to no effect. It's God's message. And it's holy and it's pure. It causes our eyes to burn at times. It makes our lives uncomfortable at times. Thirdly, it creates heartburn in us. We know down deep inside, I need to make a decision about this. Man, if you're not a Christian this morning and you're hearing right now, Jesus loves you. He died on the cross for your sins. He's God that came down at Christmas time, born in a manger in Bethlehem. And he rose again from the grave to get you into heaven. That's how valuable you are. You never again have to worry about self-esteem. God is nuts about you. But there's a problem. You've got all this junk on you from your past life up into this moment, and he wants to wash it away. That's why he died. And he wants to scrub you, as it were, with a, a pad, a Brillo pad, dipped in blood. And he washes you clean. He does that in a second. He loves you so much. And if a person hears that and says, man, I'm not a sinner. I think I, I eat, drink, and be merry, and I don't want to hear this stuff. And that makes me uncomfortable. Listen, your heartburn can lead you to Christ. It can also lead you away from Christ. It depends on what you decide to do with it. It also brings hope to the soul. Did you know that? A church alive and a biblically-based church should bring hope to your soul. Number five, it should give peace to your mind. This is the most important thing for one of the most important things for me personally. You can imagine in a church this size, all the stuff that people imagine or think, say or do or whatever, I don't know. And listen, at night when I lay my head down, there's only one, there's only one person that knows the absolute truth. And that's God and my wife. <laughs> right? Peace. Do you have peace? When you lay your head down at night, are you free? I thank God it happened last night. It's been going on for about 31, 33 years, 33 years. I lay my head down and I'm asleep in five minutes. Why? Because Lord, check all the bases. Are we good, Father? What, did I offend you today? Did I offend anyone today? Did I somehow misrepresent you today? Speak to me, Lord. You know he's so good. If you pray that prayer, and you, Lord, speak to me. Man, I'm not hearing anything. Lord, talk to me. And then you start thinking, okay, I kicked the dog in the hallway, but that was accident. I didn't even see the dog. <laughs> you know, you go down that list, trust me, my friend, as a Christian, the Lord is very, very able to speak to you. You don't have to sit there and make stuff up. Um, I did 56 and a 55. I think I went 56 and a 55. If you, if God is upset, he will speak, and you will know it. Just don't pray that prayer with the TV on or a radio blasting. Get alone. And then here's the great part. You, haven't, you have that moment with God, and you lay your head down, and you, you'll go to sleep in moments. Doesn't the Bible say he giveth his beloved sleep? He, um, he loves me, and he loves you. The Bible tells us in the book of Acts, I'll just paraphrase it for time's sake. The Bible says in Acts chapter 5, verses 28 to 33, that when the gospel was being preached, the authorities got upset and they said, you are not to speak any longer and preach in his name. <laughs> you know the famous statement. They said, it's better for us to obey God rather than man. And when they preached, and Peter preached and says, you know what, it's by your hands that you crucified the Lord of glory. He's the one that we preach. The Bible says, and they were cut to the heart when they heard that. Very important. We need to be careful, church, that our doctrine is God's doctrine, that we're not trying to convince God of our doctrine that we make up. In a word, Bible. Are you going to marry somebody? Are you going to move? Are you pursuing a job? Do you have family issues? Is it a marital issue? Get your answer from the Bible. Absolute authority, the Bible. The strength is in the Bible. If you don't, our emotions will try to dictate what our doctrine will be. And that will always lead us astray. Repenting before loving God, before we head off to the third point this morning, I want you to picture this in your mind. It's John chapter 8. You can write down the verse. John 8, verses 2 to 11. John 8, 2 to 11. Is this not our God? Now watch this. You want to talk about sexual immorality. 
Can you imagine with me? John chapter 8, I'll read it. A woman caught in the act of adultery. That's sexual immorality. She's caught. They grab her and drag her to Jesus' feet. Can you imagine? Have you ever got your hand? Have you ever been caught with, the, with your hand in the cookie jar? <clears throat> Lisa says, don't eat, this. don't eat this until it's dinner time. And she walks around the corner and I've got the spoon in my mouth. <laughs> Immediately, your ability to lie is profound. I was just testing it to see if you needed salt or something. As your nose grows, you know. You're busted. Little Junior, did you eat a cookie? I, just, I told you not to eat a cookie. And they have crumbs all over their face and they're going like this with their hands. They got the, they're shaking the crumbs off. Busted. Imagine this woman is in the act of adultery and she gets caught and they grab her and they bring her to the feet of God in human skin. Jesus. What would you do? Listen to this. Now early in the morning he came again to the temple and all the people came to him and he sat down and he taught them. And then the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery I've always wondered, what were they, how did they catch her? What were they doing there? Anyway. <laughs> and when they had, and where's the guy? The, Moses says, bring both of them. Anyway, I think, she, I think it was a setup. The scribes and Pharisees brought her to him, caught in, caught in the act of adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to Jesus, teacher, this woman was caught in adultery, the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded that such a one should be stoned, but what do you say? Isn't that, I think that's amazing that they would have that debate in their head. Because they knew he loved the law, but they knew he was gracious. This they said, testing him, that they might have something to which they could accuse him of. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he didn't hear them. So when they continued asking him, the word means they wore on. You know, to... it's just sickening. And he's writing in the dirt. I kind of, I think I know what he was writing in the dirt. But So he's stooped down, he's writing, and they continue on. And he says to them, as he raised himself up, he who is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote in the ground. I think he wrote all the sins of the people who were accusing her. I think he was just looking at that guy. What, this guy's Fred. Fred. <laughs> Mike. I really do. I, I think, listen, I don't think that's a stretch. Watch this. And those that heard it being convicted by their conscience, that's where the Holy Spirit lives, went out one by one, beginning at the oldest. The oldest left first, down to the youngest. And Jesus was left alone. Why did the oldest guy leave first? Because when Jesus started, older people have more sins than younger people do. They've lived longer. They've had more time to sin. He probably looked at the old guy. Fred. Barney, guys younger, Betty, Wilma, but younger, younger, until the youngest one left, and there's nobody there. And Jesus said to her, woman, where are your accusers? And she says, it appears that I have none, sir. And he says, woman, neither do I accuse you. Go and sin no more. Go and live your life and make sure that this has no hold on you any longer. What a power... What a powerful statement for us to repent before our loving God. Third point is this. We'll go as far as we can, which will be like seven minutes worth. Five minutes worth. No, no time at all now. We have, I just got the red light. Listen. This is table talk stuff. This is stuff... I know it's not the normal Sunday morning church service. It's not going to be until, until after we get done with part three of this. This is serious stuff, and yet it touches every one of our lives. Listen. Your life 
God wants to radically restore. Christian that's backslidden or non-believer. He wants to restore you to him. And in this gathering this morning, there's probably predominantly three camps of people. There are those who are doing everything they can to walk with Jesus, and it's a beautiful place to be. Now, if you're out there thinking, well, man, that seems like it's hard. No, 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 that's a lie from the flesh and from the enemy. Let me tell you, it's much easier to walk daily with Jesus than it is to be like a stray bullet ricocheting off the wall all over the place. That's a hard life. Are you a Christian and you just cannot, listen, you cannot control your sexual appetite. Listen, you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. No man or woman, look at King David. A man after God's own heart. A man who is profoundly represented in the Bible. Was a, not only an adulterer, he was a murderer. But when he woke up, he said, One thing have I desired, and that, not Bathsheba, will I seek after. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Amen. You guys... If you'd be honest with God right now, you could say, Lord, I struggle in this area. Do you say, for example, please listen to me. This is family. Are we family? Yeah. Here's the deal. If you're struggling with your past, and that's behind you, it's past, but it haunts you. You need to, you need to trust the Lord, my friend. He says, I will remove your sin, and I have removed your sin from you so far that I removed it as far as the east is from the west. East never hits west. It's, impo it's impossible. That's how far it is from you. You need to believe him. Number two, if you're living in a way where you've got, you've got no power, you think, to resist the temptations that come into your life, you need to say, Lord, fill me with your spirit. Fill that void up so that none of that stuff has any ability to get in. And what I'm going to say to you, I mean with all passion. I believe that the church is dying today. I'm talking about the church in the world is dying today because there is a desert, a vacuum of godly men. I believe that there are godly women in the waiting. Because I think Satan, did you know, male or female, I think from the beginning, Satan has always had it out for men. He knew from Scripture that the Messiah would be a man. I find it interesting that the number one, by far, miscarriage rate, a child miscarriage, predominantly, heavily, heavily, predominantly male children are, are uh, miscarried. Did you know that? It's for whatever reason, it's harder for a male to come to birth. The pressures that a culture puts upon a male. You look at the Bible, and the Bible puts a, a place of, of responsibility to the male. And if God is, listen, if God has called the man to be the leader, then where are the leaders? I think there are a lot of good men, like the Marines, they're just looking for a few. I think men today, because they're void of the Holy Spirit governing their lives, they'll click on a pornographic site, commit sexual immorality in their minds, become so condemned and so guilt-ridden that they, they walk their life like this. They're a failure at their marriage. They're a failure with their kids. They're a failure compared to what is stirring in their hearts. They're living a sub normal Christian life. And you, you don't think anybody's watching. My friend, you know God is watching. And here's the thing. Will you be so filled with the Holy Spirit that that trash can't get in? Because listen, will you allow yourself to fall in love with the power of God in your life so that he's using you? Ken and I were talking about this before service this morning, that God would keep us usable. To love when God uses you so much more than a five-second click. My friends, listen, male, female, it's not worth it. What the world is offering you, it's not worth it. Don't do it. 
Don't even go there. Don't even allow it. You say, well, I, I see a computer and I, go, I run to Then throw the computer away. Do you love it more than God? Get it out of there. Well, every time I drive down that street or that freeway, there's those billboards. Then take another freeway. Love him more. Watch what happens. If a few men will do this, it will spark a flame. And I don't think the world has yet seen in these last days what God can do with a few good men and women sold out to him. And so Paul writes this letter to get you and I ready for the days ahead. Can't be a spectator to it. You got to be in it. Father, how we love your word, so honest, so clear, so direct. Your word is a lamp and a light to the path and to our feet. And Father, I do pray that right now, right where my brothers and sisters are seated right now, that they would agree with me. That they would say, Lord, fill me now with your Holy Spirit's power. I don't care about this gift of the Spirit and that gift of the Spirit. I could care less. I want to walk holy. I want to walk sanctified. I want to walk straight with you, Lord God. I pray that you would move in my life and that you would fill me now with the power of your Holy Spirit to live for your glory. Christian, pray that prayer. And maybe this morning you are not even sure if you're a Christian or not. I don't know what you think, but listen, you need to make sure today that you're trusting in one and one only, and that's Jesus who died on the cross for your sins. That right where you're at right now, you can tell him, Lord, forgive me. Write my name in your book of life. I believe you died and rose again from the grave. Lord God, I just give you my life now. If you've made that prayer, that decision, I, I want to know that. We want to know. Let us know. But Father, I pray that from this moment onward, though we've prayed it privately as a staff and as pastors, I pray it now publicly. From this moment onward, based upon 1 Corinthians here, Father, I pray that you'd bring to this church those that you would and you would keep out those that you would. That you would be the profound, clear, and ever-present pastor, priest, and prophet of this church. And we would, Lord, follow you wherever you go. We ask this in Jesus' name and all God's people say.